Welcome to Growth Brands and More, the podcast where curiosity meets inside to explore the frontiers of marketing. I am Filiberto Amati, your host. Every week we explore international marketing, consumer trends, and brand strategy. Whether you are an entrepreneur, a seasoned marketing professional, or fascinated by brands' power to shape our world, you come to the right place. In this space, we decode the secrets of growth, unravel the latest in brand innovation, and examine what makes consumer tick and brands memorable. From exclusive interviews with industry leaders to deep dives with mind shaping the future of marketing, Growth Brands and More is your go-to source for insight and strategy that inspires action. Let's learn, grow, and be inspired. My guest today is uh, Paul Markowitz. Uh, welcome, Paul. We met in 2000 in Strombeck Bever in Brussels, Shea, Procter & Gamble at the time, where we both worked for the market research department or consumer market knowledge when it was called like that. And Paul had a fantastic and interesting career uh, moving from market research to brand management, from consumer goods to telecom, and then to my preferred categories, beer. You've been in consulting as well. You've been keeping busy. <laughs> no, Paul? That's true. That's true. Good. That's true. It's been so, a while. What, what's your last challenge? What were you up to? What are you doing these days? Uh... I have been in fast-moving consumer goods most of my life. I started marketing in 1991 in Romania. At the time, it was about political marketing because there wasn't much else. I moved into FMCG and Procter & Gamble in 1995, so that's how we got to meet later. I started in brand management in, in Procter & Gamble in the Balkans, in the Bucharest office. And then went for studies. And when I came back, I was seduced by the work of the, like you called it, the CMK, the consumer, Customer and Market Knowledge, Consumer and Market Knowledge Department. I felt that seduced by the dark good side, continuation but... of what I've done. <laughs> Probably the bright side. Probably the bright side because I was feeling that that was the touch of intellectuality that I have gained through the master's program. So I felt that I could contribute more with that. I had a good run of a career getting to senior uh, planner pretty fast. So, and then the each after a special assignment in Russia for launching a, a tier four laundry brand made me return into brand management, which I continued in two of the core categories of P&G at the time. Fabric care, which you are so fond of because you we were together in, the, in Brussels in the global center, but also beauty care. So I was a brand manager of Old Spice in Hungary and Secret. Uh, and I have to claim the pride of having the best market share outside the US for Old Spice was in Hungary. We had almost 20% market share in a highly yes. fragmented market. And I'd like to believe that I have something to do with it. Having said that, I moved on. I moved back to my home country in, in telecom, and I was in charge with converting a local, the first GSM operator in Romania into Vodafone. Vodafone just uh, bought it, and uh, I had one year to go from 37.9% awareness of the former Connex brand, which was the biggest Romanian brand, and I'm still part of some of the WhatsApp groups of the ex Connex people that are, after so many years, are still holding on to convert it into the 37.9% awareness of Vodafone brand in 12 months. In a sense, that's something that I'm going to tell my grandchildren probably that I was the mercenary that converted one of the strongest Romanian brands into a big global brand, the big red wolf called Vodafone at the time. But I think I've done. Uh, it's for the better, and I think it's a much stronger brand. And I left this brand um, as position one in, in Romania at the time. There were very heroic times, if you can imagine, that sponsoring concerts was the big thing that was creating brand loyalty at the time. And we had Beyonce concerts and Shakira concerts, and I even started negotiating with Madonna at a certain moment. 
and then she opted for a new republic in the Balkans at the time, just gained independence, and she, she, in 2008 she went and did the concert there. But all things were well done. Not Lately, a bad job, later, though, huh? Yeah. Later she came uh, to Romania also, but I already moved on into beer, and I... As of 2010, I worked as a marketing director by then. So last time we met, I was a senior planner, then senior brand manager, but somehow break through the, the glass ceiling to the marketing director level in Vodafone and then marketing uh, director in Heineken. So 2010, I worked for Heineken in uh, Romania and we part of the Global Brand Academy that was teaching brand management in Amsterdam for the whole world, which was a very nice assignment for me. Then after Heineken, then I moved on and worked for another, I, like you said, I worked in beer almost 11 years. Some people said it's immoral to have free beer for 11 years. But here I was uh, trying to create a new portfolio for Carlsberg, which is a brand with a fantastic history. And I try to increase the footprint in Horeca, creating a portfolio of beers that were spanning 1,000 years of beer history, starting with Weinstefaner and going through Guinness, Carlsberg, of course, Blanc, something that you might know recently, even your countries. Of course, Poret from your country, another interesting beer brand with a birificio. I learned this word <laughs> and I always thought that birificio has something so premium in it because edificio is a big building, a pre precious building. So birificio was a precious beer building brewery. As I said, I worked there almost seven years and I'm now reinventing myself in something totally new. So most of my life was direct to consumer. Now I'm in a business to business position, working for an agricultural holding and trying to promote the agriculture of the future. I'm working in a holding that besides giving technic technological solutions inputs, it also provides financing for the farmers, but also technology. So I'm a lot preoccupied on a daily basis about digitalization and how to make digital agriculture, precision agriculture, a big success. So that's what I do. I'm, I've gone around and now I'm, as I, you might say, I have integrated myself on a scale, not processing the barley, but I'm making sure that it gets created for the beer. The barley. Yeah, I was going to say, you moved up in the agricultural side of the beer yeah. business in a way Indeed. or Indeed. spirits in general <laughs> true true so um, thank you very much for this interaction chat i think that the reason why i invited you it's because you have of course international experience on a global and regional level for very large brands but in particular because you worked for very large brands uh, international and global in, in a specific market. So I'm interested really in understanding how you take the journey from a global blend and making it happen locally in that sense, no? So the first question I'm gonna ask, which is a question I'm asking all my guests is, what is a good brand strategy? And in particular, from the point of view of someone who's been the local marketing director of Heineken, the local marketing director of Vodafone, the vice president of Carlsberg in a country, so that you know you're dealing with an entity that goes beyond the boundaries of your country, but you also need to take in consideration the local aspects, the local dimension. So what is a good brand strategy? The short answer is the relevant one. Uh, if I try to make it longer, the relevant and persuasive. Now, without trying to be elliptic, I think the big challenge of every global brand is to be relevant locally. And when I judge uh, these strategies, I would like to make a very uh, important distinction between brands that are built on functional attributes a lot, uh, 
and with as much as I do, that a lot of the laundry detergents started in most of the markets with the functional benefits. They tried first to create a platform of credibility. So they had to resort to portraying their functional benefits and then later on came with, with the emotional benefits. One of the brands was Tide that we worked on. We started with the whitest whites and then we went into Supermothers, something that the competition also copied. And that's the best compliment that competition can make. They can imitate you. So whenever they imitate you, you shouldn't get uh, upset. You just need to admit it and reinvent yourself. It's a compliment. It's a, It's finally uh, somebody as professional as you is confirming that you're doing the right thing. Having said that, it's like winning an FE or a can bluff. Yeah, it comes also with the FEs, but sometimes they just imitate and very often they imitate you after you got an FE. An FE might be a lot of honor, a lot of joy, but sometimes it's also a trigger for people to imitate you, which is fine. I've had my share of FEs and I can testify that it obliges you to reinvent you, yourself because by then everything becomes very public. The things that you have to put in an FE case, whether you like it or not, are there. So your strategy is in the open. Everybody can eventually read it, but people watch you afterwards. Even if they didn't see your commercial, maybe, or your full campaign, after you got an FE, they become interested and they dig after you. But coming back to brand strategies and global brands, they always have to have local relevancy. So that is, we'll probably need to also talk how you measure the success of a strategy. And here I'm going to put probably the other two heads. As a market researcher and as a brand manager, you always talk about the brand footprint and the market share. So the good strategy is the one that secures a decent market share. A good strategy is the one that gives a solid and sustainable footprint of the brand in the market. So it's not about buying your market share through i don't know what kind of promotions you need to build especially in during crisis and we have seen this in 2008 we have seen this in other crises after people are tempted to do a lot of promotions and to buy market share that's not a sustainable market share so it's a tactic it's not a strategy actually i used to say that never at full price is not a good strategy yeah <laughs> because then you're never at full price the the strategy needs to stay relevant and There are phases in the um, life of a brand where you need to admit it that you have to be more emotional or more functional. In my experience, uh, you need them both. And a lot of the agencies are forcing you to take a a stand and say, now you want to be uh, functional, but it's not good. And let's do emotional because this is what sells. All that we have learned from neurosciences and neuromarketing, and I forgot to tell you that I also had a stint with a research agency that was doing neuromarketing measurements, nice. the brain waves and all that. It's one of the professors that are living with you in Warsaw, Professor Om, Rafa Om, that I worked with him on trying to make neuro research possible in Romania. Uh, it was one of my entrepreneur stints that I made an exit from. I didn't necessarily get rich, but I got extremely wise after that. Um, <laughs> That's good. That's a win-win at least. You, know, you yeah, won I learned at least a lot. some part of it. I learned a lot about neuromarketing, but I learned a lot about business and cash flows too. So coming back to what uh, neuromarketing is proving is, yes, of course, we are trying to activate the pleasure uh, center on the brain and try to minimize the uh, pain avoidance uh, center. And in that light, uh, of course, many of the campaigns that we have done for the past 30 years, I dare to say, could be rejudged. Um, But there is a, a, a prefrontal cortex that is helping you to judge. And this is where the functional attributes will help you. Between two pleasurable, non displeasurable campaigns, you will tend to make an arbiter. And that's where the rational side of our brain and thinking helps. And that's where sometimes the functional attributes come into play. So to cut short a long story, a brand strategy is the one that secures a good market share, a good footprint in the market. 
and it's built on both emotional and functional attributes. Either one, if you do to the extreme, you run the risk of being dry with the functional one or being just an emotional syrup without substance if you're only on, on emotional attributes. No, in fact, I, I, uh, I always uh, remind uh, agencies uh, when I work with them for clients that uh, when we talk about benefits, we're talking about uh, benefits laddering. And uh, it's called the ladder because there are several steps into it, no? functional, emotional, societal, and so on and so on. And if from a ladder you start removing uh, intermediate uh, steps, uh, then it becomes very uh, a very unsafe place, uh, so to speak. That's the metaphor. I like what you said about the importance of having a, a, a sustainable and organic footprint. Because beverage, what's happening in beverages, there is a lot of... Uh, craft uh, up and coming beverages especially in the us uh, which are gaining lots and lots of attraction and they've been developed through external partner investments venture capitals shark tanks uh, you name it but these guys at the end of the day they're building brands with 40 50 60 percent of their volume in promotion which basically means that when you switch it off when you suddenly decide that you need to make money for it, the house of cards falls down and you have what kind of footprint you have. And it's important always to look at the, this is probably the market researcher in me, but really what are the basics, the penetration, what's the frequency of the category, what's the frequency that you repurchase that you are actually gaining? Are you spot on the drinking occasions? Are you tapping all the drinking occasions? So the, really the fundamental dynamics, because those are important too. There is one more detail that I didn't tell about you, my life. I went to school to Chico State. Chico State is actually the same city with uh, the Sierra Nevada breweries, which is one of the biggest craft, craft yeah. beer. So... Think about it, Sierra Nevada Brewery was already a big brewery in 95 when I was a student there. And I was always envious about the guys that didn't have to work and could spend time at the brewery. And I was in the computer lab earning my uh, few dollars, right? The, the craft beer became, it took 15, almost 17 years to get out of the States and come to Europe. I had once visited the Brooklyn Brewery in Stockholm, which was me was a fantastic experience. And I even had a post and I said another day, another hard day in the office and everybody envied me for two months after. So with the exception of Brooklyn and Sierra Nevada, a lot of the craft beers are more of a marketing and storytelling success than a commercial success. But with scale, I have to admit that these are a very good commercial successes also. So Brooklyn and Sierra Nevada, if we talk about craft beer. Also in, in my country, there is a beer, uh, Zaganu, that was established by two entrepreneurs. Again, they took the top of the market in Horeca, but they, when where the volumes are in retail, they couldn't necessarily make such a, a big success. And a lot of the retailers, Judging by this, they gave a lot of uh, shelf space to the beer market, to the craft beers. So if you go on the aisle, of course, because they are in the real estate business and by the meter, they were taking more money and more shelf taxes from all the little beers that are there. But they are not moving. Some of them even catching dust on the shelf. It takes more than just having a brilliant idea. Of course, innovation is a big driver of the category. And for that, probably the torture market of beverages is Japan, right? They have at least two new beverages every day. Yeah, they have fantastic rhythm of putting out things. And some catch up, some don't. But at least... Well, some of those ideas in Europe, uh, they, they wouldn't make yeah. it through the door, eh? Yeah, exactly. But that's why I'm saying that in that geography, 
since we are talking about global markets, innovation is the driver. Everything has to be the new thing, the new fruits, the new beer, the new kinds of combination between beer and fruits. And you also know that I worked on launching Radler in Romania at the time. It was an innovation. Then everybody came in and created a segment for uh, the beers. Um, Non-alcoholic were also is a big trend. So craft is also another trend in beer. Yeah, like I said, the Radlers of the world, the non-alcoholic wheat flavored, the flavored craft is also there. But quenching thirst with something with an IPA is sometimes uh, inhibiting the volumes. You drink one, you drink two, but you will not drink four or five. And we used to have our Czech colleagues, remember in PNG, that could drink five beers in a sitting because the, the beer was 3.5, was uh, more of a hydrating thing. The bitterness and the alcohol content, uh, which very often comes in craft beers, would actually be the uh, biggest inhibitor of future consumption. So it inhibits their commercial success in a way because they will not generate the same kind of volumes. Although, as you said, the okay, drinking occasion is there. The intention to consume is there. But somehow uh, I noticed that people who would used to drink four lagers, they drink two craft beers. Yeah, man, the, the, in my I mean, and ale, it's also from a digestion point of view, not only from a wallet point of view, heavier. <laughs> in fact, and it was the course... big trend of making... Uh, Every sort of craft beer, a session beer, the session, no? Because they wanted yes. uh, to prolong and extend it's, it's uh, true. I mean, consumption. It's a moment of indulgence and it is pampering yourself with a very diverse taste and you explore different kind of hops. As I said, I got the inspiration from Brooklyn, their Luma, for example, inspired to create a dry hopping version of Carlsberg internationally. And we launched it first in Israel. Now it's launched also in, in Romania. Dry hopping, in my mind, is a good way to bring the benefits of a craft into a brand that could work as a mass brand, a, a premium. Granted, it's a premium brand. It's not really a mass brand. It's a premium brand. But the core craft is tough. Yeah, no, crafty no. beers, they might have a success commercially, but core craft beers uh, would be the victims of their own formula and success. Mm -hmm. Let's go back then to the marketing branding strategy. As a, an expert who has been on research and has been uh, on consulting and on the brand owner side, when you look at what others are doing, what does it give you? The ha, huh, that's a good strategy type of, type of reaction. What are the elements that make you think these guys are doing a good job? Or alternate, what are the elements that make you think they, they are not really doing a good job and you wonder why they are making certain decisions? As a consumer, you never see a strategy. You get to see a strategy when you are sometimes a consultant, okay? What you do see outside is the execution of that strategy. So the strategy as a set of choices, a set of decisions that were made by the client or, or let's say the producer is only visible if you're a consultant and you get to read their strategy documents or you get a brief in, in a pitch context, very often you have their the strategy. One of the clearest, but, but you do feel the strategy very often in a slogan. Now, the slogan is very often the shorthand and the creative transformation of the strategy statement. And I'm going to refer now, for example, to Heineken because everybody knows it. Heineken, as a strategy, is about global citizenship. When you talk about born in Amsterdam and raised by the world, it is a strategy for a global brand that it's pretty obvious that wants to be the best, the most consumed beer in the world. And mm -hmm. actually it, it got there. It is a Dutch beer. It doesn't come from Germany or it doesn't come from Belgium, where you would expect with all the beer traditions. It does come from Netherlands. 
Amstel, for example, the other big Dutch brand, is not so widely known. Of course, Southern Europe could contradict me. It's a big brand in Greece, for example. If you go vacation, in Greece, in Spain, also. Yeah. Heineken took the decision of being a global brand and being for the cosmopolitan citizens of this world. So you can see that in all the executions and you have this aha moment at whatever commercial you look at. Now, beyond commercials, their sponsoring strategy, going for UEFA, going for the most valuable, I don't want to sound very European-centric, but UEFA is being seen across the world is appreciated. I remember spending time in a bar in Hong Kong, full of people watching uh, an UEFA uh, semi-final. Yeah. So it is consumed outside Europe. Um, Formula One, again, another big asset that they went after. I used to work with these assets also in the uh, context of Vodafone. So when you are a big global player, you have to take beyond the commercials that you make with global people and all that, you have to take also assets in terms of activation that are conveying the similar message that you are a global player. So Formula One and UEFA are probably the best known, the most expensive, the most appreciated assets. And of course, you would say there are only six or seven sponsors that are allowed to be there. So it's also a, a big fight for this kind of assets. But to come back to your question, this global citizenship that is part of the strategy of Heineken is being executed and you can have, you feel it, not only looking at their commercials and videos, but you also look at their sponsoring assets. Another interesting way, again, coming back to, to Heineken, was during the pandemics. If you remember, there was a campaign where they bought outdoor on all the bars that were closed. So that was giving a support to the bar owners that had to be closed and put advertise there. Again, if you are a major player in Horeca, in the internationally, then you do also this kind of actions. There are commercials about the non-alcoholic. There is a movie where there is a boy and a girl ordering a cocktail and a beer. And when the bartender comes, puts the cocktail in front of her and the beer in front of him, but they actually English they reverse hoping. it because she ordered the beer and he ordered it. So it's an anti-cliche. So when you have this kind of stature of the brand, you need to take on hot topics, which was gender bias. But how do you make that happen locally? Through, uh, first of all... Uh, in a relevant big, way, because the execution, you have the assets. The, the, how do you make it relevant to a local market where gender bias might or might not be that that is that is the job of the local people to understand their own society and to understand what out of a global toolbox makes sense for the local market and you might choose not to activate things also in the toolbox of heineken there was something about rugby now romania is an aspirant of the rugby six nations tour, uh, tour. however we didn't activate so much um Rugby, we activated football. We activated Formula One, but not so much rugby. So you need to be choiceful. The duty of a global brand manager is to think about the market that he's servicing, to put out a toolbox accessible, and all these technology today, uh, all the cloud computing and all the cloud servers are helping, making a tremendous job in being able to disseminate fast uh, this toolbox, all kinds of little movie snippets, five seconds, six seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 45 seconds cut. You can use them for social media, for TV. You can translate them for radio. The duty of the global brand manager is to create a globally relevant toolbox. And the job of the local marketing people is to understand first and foremost their consumer and society and pick from the shelf whatever makes sense to the local market. And as we go back to the strategy word, it's about choices, what yeah. to do and what not to do also. Yeah, but the global brand is obliged to provide the range of tools. So rugby would make sense for Australia, but not necessarily for Romania, for example. 
but and and I think that there is probably, and I like your comment on that, an extra dimension, which is not all the markets are tier one markets. Not all the markets have the resources uh, to activate uh, the Champions League partnership, so to speak. No, uh, so how deep uh, this toolbox needs to be or how thoughtful needs to be the brand management because if it's only things that uh, are going to cost you a million bucks in licenses maybe that's your whole budget then if you buy the license you don't have the execu- you don't have any resources for the execution you're right i was spoiled i was accessing i was fortunate enough to work on big brands that had uh, the resources. The one detail that I was always attentive at, and I can speak for myself as a, as a choice, be conscious of the fact that we are living in the global village. It's, I'm not the first one who said that, Marsha McLuhan said it much before. So our consumers will, will see if there is a global campaign. And the biggest thing that I, I was fighting for is not to make my consumers feeling secondhand citizens of the world. It's very important. So when you talk about what is the minimum thing that you can do, is definitely take the global films and translate them and subtitle them and try to put them on air or put them on, at least on your own social media. Today is, is okay, you don't need necessarily big media budgets on TV, although TV is decreasing everywhere, but it's still, let's say, 50% of the budgets is still on TV, in FMCG at least, give them a sense that they belong to the global community of the brand users. This is important. Can you or can you not activate the global assets? Okay, maybe you ten, send 10 people, make a, a contest for 10 people to go to EFA. You don't have to send 100. But seeing maybe you send only three to the final, but four, you send four to the semifinal somewhere, if we are speaking about UEFA. But the most important thing is they have bought into a global brand. They need to be part of that global brand users community. Don't make them feel secondhand citizens mm-hmm. of the brand community. It's a, it's a great insight. Going back to the strategy. Two questions. How do you measure a good strategy? And you partially answered that. And how long does it take to measure a good strategy? And the contest here being, I see tons of U-turns of brands, local, global, regional, whatever, emerging, established, which keep changing their assets or their directions or their slogan every six to nine months. And so I'm interested in understanding your point of view on what do you really track? What do you measure? And how long does it take to have any measurable results? Because you activate UEFA, how do you know it's actually delivering on that? How long does it take? I have a rule of thumb for this. It's a heuristic. It's not so much scientific. I used to say that first things happen first time. Second time is a coincidence. It becomes a tradition after the third time. So I think you need to give you the opportunity for your target group to experience at least three times something that you want them to experience what is part of your strategy. But to come back to your original question, do, how do you measure a strategy? I think I said a strategy is there to be measured on the longer term and the, the ultimate stake of a strategy is to have a healthy footprint. So share, market share, is that something that helps you measure whether you are on the right track. Up or down the market, it doesn't matter. You are in a crisis, but you should never lose market share. And I'm even a big fan of investing during crisis because when everybody is not investing, all of a sudden your investment gets a bigger attention. So never miss a good crisis. And another heuristic that I use when trying to stay course on a good strategy. I said earlier that consumers and your target never sees a strategy. 
as a consultant, you might see a strategy. As an agency, you see a strategy in a pitch invitation. They see execution. So it's important to measure also the execution because no matter what strategy you have, I think no good execution can save a bad strategy. But a bad execution could always ruin a good strategy. So that's why even if you have the good strategy, you need to measure the execution because this is what your consumers will experience. So you have a good strategy of saying, I want to do a FA championship uh, activation or I have a big asset like Liverpool in the case of Carlsberg. But then make sure that people experience that in a way. It, it's a coveted experience. They want to meet the football players from Liverpool or they want to meet or they want to go to see a match on Ainsfield. Give them that chance because otherwise you have a good strategy, but if they never experience it, that is the execution is poor. So don't sit on the assets. Try to make them accessible one way or another. The cheapest way of accessing a, a match is to do some Horeca viewing. Yeah. Invite people to come to a, a bar, put a big screen. It's not so expensive anymore. Incomparable to, say, buy 20 flight tickets and give them that opportunity to experience it. And you're still on strategy. It's a cheaper way of executing the strategy of being part of the, your global consumer uh, pool. Yeah, and it's but it's probably 200 people <laughs> rather than 20 in that sense. So it's also a good trade-off. Exactly. It's less of an experience memorable because, of course, being flown to one answer road and going into the locker room, sitting on the, it's a totally different experience. experience. But, but not everybody has the time. Even if they, they say you can afford it, there might be people who cannot. Of course, the they can, yeah. some people cannot afford to leave uh, work for two, three days. So it's also true that it is, you know. It's or in, in Formula One, in Formula One, for example, it's important to buy those headsets that also give you, in. you can hear the channel of the mm -hmm. pinball. Right? You watch the race, but you don't understand much. If you get the sound in your headset, it's all of a sudden a totally different experience. experience. Yeah. Going back on a good strategy can be ruined by execution, by the wrong execution or a bad execution. So how do you bridge one into another? How do you convert a good strategy into a good execution? Based on your experience, not only in beverages, but activating telecom brands and now on the B2B agricultural side. What do you see are the patterns, the elements that are recurring? Um, when you decide on a strategy, very often you make a lot of research and it's not something that you wake up one morning and put it on a piece of paper and say, this is my strategy. Certain number is do, eh, by the way. Wonderful. Good luck. Good for them. <laughs> I, I don't tell them good business. I tell them good luck because it's a matter of luck. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe they might be hitting the spot with by chance, but what are the real possibilities to do that? So usually the strategy is something well thought of, looking at the market, looking at the target group, at the needs, at the uh, sources of information. How do they consume information? What makes them tick? Okay, so all these things are there because strategy is about what will make them buy me in front of the, instead of the competition, buy me more often and in bigger quantities. And somehow goes back to something that we learned early in our career, the volume formula. How many people buy you, how frequently and how for, how big the purchase per occasion and at what price? And that will give you the value of your business. If you want to go back to shares, we talk about volume shares, but we also talk about value shares. How much money, how much value are you offering and how much value can you capture from the market? So a good strategy is the one that allows you to capture value from the market. Because if you don't capture value, you cannot reinvest in your business. And that means you are a fad. You are not a sustainable business. So again, 
not volume share only, value share is there. Having said that, again, strategy is, and you might have a flashback here to our ABM college. Strategy is the first question that you put whenever you see any kind of execution. Is it on strategy? Is it off strategy? And that is, to me, the bridge. And I have to admit, I learned it 30 years ago almost, yeah, 95. I learned it the first time in PNG when they said there was this um, copy comments organizer that we used to get, and I'm still carrying it in my wallet. And the first question is this, on, you allow yourself an honest consumer reaction. Do you like it or not? And I was, as a researcher, I was always puzzled how much of the gut feel you let into the ex, uh, into the decision. But that is what the consumer will experience, your client will experience. They are not so fond of the category as you are. For them, it's very much if the now neuroscience is telling us if the little brain will allow it for central processing or not. If it's not allowed for central processing, you don't get to be judged for anything else. So the first gut reaction is extremely important. So if you don't get past this gate, your execution is bad. It doesn't matter whether it's on the right strategy or not on the right strategy, but it has to pass the filter of that. After that, you get into the brain of the consumer. You better deliver the right message. And this is where the, are you on strategy or not important. So to come back to your question, where is the bridge between strategy and execution? Any execution needs to be on strategy, but an execution that doesn't pass the filter of the little brain, it will never have a chance to leave a, a good impression. And that impression needs to be on strategy. Does that which, make sense? Have I gone too which much makes around? sense, but the question is, how do you explain that uh, to a 25-year-old assistant brand manager who's got uh, 12 months of experience and needs to create uh, your below-the-line campaign? You teach them, you tell them, and ultimately, you tell them to look at your hair. Maybe you have something to say. <laughs> oh, no. uh, joke, aside, hair in, uh... joke aside, I think it's part of what the good companies and good business schools deliver. We have much more talented, much more informed assistant brand managers today coming out of school with lots of stuff. And as I said, we never talked about neuroscience in 95 when we looked at those things. But the progress of science and neurosciences in marketing has proved that it was right our thinking at that. At the time, the thinking was coming much more from experience, from error, trial and error loops, but they get confirmed in time. And that was our luxury dealing with uh, a company that had 150 years of experience in the market at the time, right? Now, science is helping us to uh, point them. And one of the easy ways is you just tell them to Google it. Whatever you told them, whatever they want to try you, and they don't believe you, they can Google it. It's a big luxury that wasn't there 30 years ago. No, absolutely. They it's a, don't believe me. <laughs> don't believe go, me. Go Google search it. for the answer. Yeah. But... In a way, this is a lot of things can go wrong if you think about it. This is, it makes sense. It's a very strategic thinking, high level, good direction. But then the execution, if you look at it from the other perspective, it's not as smooth. If you want it to be on one end engaging, your little brain and triggering certain emotional response and be on message, be on strategy. It's not an easy job. Or, or no. is it easier than it sounds? But it's not for everyone. True. It's, for, it's only for those that want to put in the effort and the understanding. The beauty of life is that there are so many other options. And on last note, uh, let's talk about the toolbox, the marketing toolbox. 
How do you make decisions? What are the aspects for in, for you in a country like Romania? What are the elements of the toolbox that you are must have? What are the elements of the toolbox which are a nice tool? Or what are the elements of the toolbox that you can live without? I think as I, we touched on it earlier. The toolbox has to be broad enough to comprise all the markets that you are servicing. And we are living in a global village, so the social media tools, social media assets, I think they are a mandatory because whether they will not see it on your own channels, on the local channel, they will see it on the global channel, okay? If they are valuable and fantastic, they will get viralized. So you will get to see. So it's not so much it's not only about having the assets, but also the timeliness of the deployment of the assets. If there is a global campaign, you better be there within the 24 hours of the launch of the global campaign. Three days later, you're too late. Because three days later, their peer group that happens to comprise, I don't know which student in Netherlands or other student in California has already put it in his peer group and the campaign is out. So as a local brand, you miss the big opportunity of, of being there. That's why I said, you might not have money for many things, but at least the social media assets, you need to take them and you need to take them timely. Be there and be in the first wave of release. That's why the global brand managers need to create some sort of discipline. There is an embargo on communication before, there is a release date, there is a window of 10 to 12 hours to cover all the time zones and so on. But not later than 12 hours because you miss the train. And then depending on your budget, depending on the relevance, depending on the size of the market, you can bring in other assets. And I just told you the... Participation, as I gave you the example of participation in the UEFA Champions uh, final, it's an obvious example. But as I said, the other asset, Formula One, you can also do that viewing, public viewings. Or for meeting players, you can do participation in the UEFA Cup used to do a tour. And they might come or they might not come to your city. So you check out your nearest city, nearest country, nearest capital. You go there, um, you send bloggers there that they can amplify for you. You might not have enough money for 20 consumers, but you have for one blogger, okay? Um, again, I might be biased because I'm talking about, from the perspective of a European market that can afford that. Other markets, other global markets should consider things. Uh, but definitely, it's a big help to have uh, your own social media channels. So that would be for me the bare minimum that you could do. And then scalable the other assets all the way through going to the headquarters, doing visits to the, I don't know, the Guinness brewery in Dublin, if you are for Guinness, going to the Carlsberg brewery in Copenhagen, if you are about that, or you go to the Heineken experience by the channel in Amsterdam. You need to give roots to the brand and this kind of experience uh, that I, I was just telling you, take them to the breweries is a, a great asset. With, with Vodafone, for example, we did a lot of cooperations, local cooperations. When the strategy was about the reliability of the network, we said telemedicine is the torture test of the reliability. So there or we activated a contract, a sponsorship contract with the mountain rescuers, Salvamont, in Romania. And now Salvamont is doing rescuing with drones that are powered and we give that are powered by the, the network. And you can find uh, people on the mountain based on their signal. So you raise a drone and the drone is covering those things. You cannot call people to see but you can film and broadcast later on your social media. So do the amplification work. Those and, make it, and make it credible and build a platform. Yeah. 
Yeah. One last question. Uh, in there is a lot of discussions with mar- within marketing and the marketing community global level right now about what's the balance between performance marketing and brand activation sales now and brand building and brand activation sales in the futures. We, the research proves that usually 5% of what you do touches your current uh, target now because they are in the market for you now, but probably 95% of what you do builds for future sales. But a lot of people say, mm, you know what, we should be more performance driven, more sales driven now, or rather than brain building. Where do you stand on that? I think you're right, but it does depend on the category. So the 1 to 20 ratio between future and present depends on the category. Definitely for impulse buying categories, that would be the case. There are some categories that are lucky enough to have 35 to 40% repeat rates. And there are not many. Okay. Maybe we talk about catamenials, we talk about tobacco. Uh, that tend to have this uh, level of loyalty. But other than that means that 60 to 90% of your uh, new clients will not repeat. So you have to feed the funnel. And to feed the funnel means that you always have a reserve contingent users that know about you, that just need to align the occasion and the need and the availability of your brand because the mental availability is already there. So investing in mental ability, I'm not the first one to say that. I think Byron Sharp said it much nicer than me, is crucial. So you need to be there in their mind. And when need, location, and mental availability align, you will get the the sale. So having said that, very few categories have anything above 25% repeat rate. There, as I said, a few categories that we worked on, 40%. But that's the max, which means you need to invest all the time. Plus, new generations are coming. So how do you stay relevant? I hope that helps. Very helpful. Uh, Paul, thank you very much. It's been a a fantastic uh, conversation. And thank you for being part uh, of my podcast and accepting the invitation. It was great to talk to you. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye.